The Hellhound is a fast-moving melee attacker with a dangerous paralyzed attack. The Hellhound will often use its high movement speed to flank your force and can destroy our weaker characters in a single hit, if not prevented from doing so. Hydras are mercifully slow but nonetheless lethal creatures that strike three times, once with each head. While this is a dangerous attack in itself, it is far less deadly than their special attack, which deals heavy damage and drastically reduces the target's armor and agility, making them hugely vulnerable to future attacks. Aspia Mages are generic magic users with the ability to cast Blaze 3. As with all such casters, they should be isolated and taken out as soon as possible to prevent heavy area of effect damage. Dire Wolves are snipers with the ability to inflict critical hits. While relatively fragile, they are able to stay away from the front lines due to their three square range. They will often pick out and destroy low defense targets if allowed to do so. High Priests are extremely effective healers with the ability to use Aura, an area of effect healing spell. While this spell has a hefty cost in mana, High Priests have large mana pools and are capable of using the spell several times. They can also use Tornado 3, a dangerous area of effect damage spell, but can usually be prevented from doing so by attacking the targets around them, forcing them to use their heals instead. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Let's Play Shining Force 3. This is Battle 16. I call it the Raid on Storic. And yes, we're going to have to have a quick look around before we move noon over anywhere. Right, this is what we're looking at. We've got a big force over there consisting mainly of bear soul soldiers, a dire wolf, and we've got these hellhounds littered all over the place. Doesn't look like a lot. But I can assure you there's going to be an awful lot more thrown at us a little bit later on. Now, we've got to watch out with the movement initially in this particular battle because the Hellhounds have a huge, huge movement range. And if we move any of our weaker characters into the range of the Hellhounds, the chances are they will run in and smack us about a bit. If we don't, they'll move forward one square, moving them into range of our knights. So we can do some hefty damage before they are able to respond. So let's do that right now and get Dantes into the thick of it. Now, you might have noticed that the enemies are getting an awful lot tougher, and that is very, very true. Because we are not promoting our characters, which would give them a huge boost into that, we are coming up against enemies that are significantly more challenging and way more dangerous than they should be at this stage of the game. I don't really mind that, because it makes for more entertaining viewing, and it's nothing that we can't handle if we play our cards right. And quite frankly, I like to play the game well, as opposed to playing it slapdash and only winning because we're vastly out-leveling or over-promoting our characters. Besides, since we've got moves like that, we really don't need to do anything like that. It's taking the Hellhound down to 1 HP, so that's pretty good. Great XP you get from these, fantastic. Which is very helpful for what we're trying to do as regards to getting our characters up to a really good level of stats very late in the game. Since we're intending to play all three scenarios, it's very important that we develop our characters properly and don't simply assume that at the end of this scenario we'll never have to use them again. That's not true. Now, this is Hayward's new bow. It's got three squares range, it's called the Fairy Bow, it's very powerful. Complete total overkill there, but a level 12 and 40 experience points for the kill. Very good indeed. This is our new character, Horse. We picked him up in Aspia, and you'll be seeing how effective he is a little bit later on. Now, those of you who were not able to attend the live broadcast, yes, we did actually do this particular battle live about a week or so ago on Ustream on Shining Force TV. And all of the future battles will be broadcast live on Ustream. So I'm still going to be putting these videos out. But if you do want to watch it live, it's the unedit unedited version and things could go horribly wrong, then by all means, check out the thread on something awful. Now, these Hellhounds can do quite a bit of damage, even to Kite, who has very high defense and has a land effect bonus on him at the moment, if I remember correctly. Still taking hefty damage. We do have to watch out. It's better, of course, that Kite gets hit than our other characters, because some of our weaker characters could get annihilated in one shot. We also have to watch out for the paralyzed attacks. These Bezel soldiers are relatively dangerous, so I don't want to move Dantes in there too early. I don't want to break the force up and be picked off, particularly with that direwolf hanging around, who has a relatively good movement speed as well as a three-square range. So, if the direwolf were to turn around and say, hey, today I would like to use a critical strike, and we can say goodbye to Dantes, and that would be very embarrassing five minutes into the battle. So now we'll take it, take it a little bit slow, get as many levels, XP, and bonuses and stats as we can, and there's plenty of XP to be had in this particular fight. The next fight is going to involve some power leveling, for one specific reason, but I'm not going to tell you what that is. Our more astute viewers can probably guess. Are upon us. 
There we go. Get Kite back up to full health. And he had another level. Very good. I mean, this battle is great for leveling. The next battle is even better. I mean, the next battle is fantastic for leveling, especially power leveling, because you're up against some enemies very early on, as opposed to having to cross the plane like this. Right, let's utilize that three square range and eliminate this hellhound. Hayward suddenly goes up an entire tier of usefulness at this point. He really does. A three square range is an absolute lifesaver, particularly with his relatively low agility, so he doesn't get to move all that fast. Now, these soldiers are, are very unpleasant against Kite because of the vulnerability that he has to the halberds. You'll also notice that the Aspia soldiers actually use the music that our force does, the Republican Tier 1 music, which will change once we get the our force promoted. We're not entirely sure why that is. You would have thought they'd have come up with another theme for it, but evidently not. Now, there's a combination that I use in this battle and will continue to use, and that's the Obright Horst 1-2 punch combination. And this is why. You set them up, particularly in these guys, you set them up, you do the initial damage with Horst, and then you finish them off with Obright. And it actually works very effectively, particularly if Horst uses his Power Crash special ability, which reduces their defense, so Obright can deliver the finishing blow. It's very effective, particularly if we keep them ar uh, hanging around Kite, who gives out that very good attack power bonus. And of course, Hayward, who gives the critical strike bonus. We utilize both of them there to great effect, making Obright a very powerful contender at this level of the game. I don't want to go too close to those guys, so I'm going to stay near the mountains, just in a hope to maybe draw one or two of them out instead of having to engage all of them at once. Yes, Dantes could move into movement range there, but he's not going to be able to kill the Dire Wolf in one hit, and we'll be facing off against a battalion of three there. And while the Wing Knight can't do a lot of damage, the Soldier and the Dire Wolf certainly can. It's not a risk that I particularly want to take at this stage of the battle. That's the Force Commander. I didn't include him in the bestiary because he is a generic commander unit. And there is really nothing, not a lot to say about him. He's got a critical ability called Full Swing, and that's it. That's all you really need to worry about. The Soldiers as well. They're just copies of the Aspia Soldiers that we saw on the bridge battle, which I believe was the last battle we showed. They're the same, with a couple of upgraded stats. Nothing to really be too interested in. Now, we've got to watch out with our characters like Masquerade and Noon particularly, because if you leave them vulnerable out on the flank like that, they can end up getting one-shotted. Pretty much everything on this battlefield at this point in time can kill our weaker characters in one hit. That's the stage that it's got to. If our characters were promoted, then they'd be a little bit more hardy, let's just say, but no. We'll, we'll keep the challenge in the battles for a few, few more battles to come. Aiming for about level 15 to 17 before we promote. That uh, Direwolf has some pretty good defense, so it's something we're going to have to watch out for. I want to move Kite forward to make sure that he can be a, a little bit of a damage soak. Hopefully we can tempt maybe the Direwolf to go after Kite, who should be particularly resilient to the ranged attacks. We'll keep the rest of our force in the mountains for the extra defense bonus for the time being. Now, Hayward can get in there. And he is in range, so let's utilize that attack power bonus. Wonderful. It's a thing of beauty. What can I say? And the bonus that they gained there, Dante has gained friendly, or well, I believe, a partnership with Hayward, which will be helpful. And the bonus that Dantes gives is not particularly great. It's a reduced chance of enemies doing critical strikes. Since not all that many enemies can really do critical strikes, it's not too much of a deal, but the extra crit that Hayward gives is very handy for Dantes. Time for Horse to wreck some fools, as it were. Does great damage, that ability, and decreases defense and agility, so that means we can bring in Obright to finish him off and use that great one-two punch combination. This should hopefully do the job. There you go. And down he goes. It's, it's a brilliant combo. I keep both of them in the Force. It's funny because a lot of the Shining Force veterans don't particularly like Horst. I really don't know why. I think Horst is absolutely fantastic. Pretty much in every respect. And keeping Obright and Horst as a 1-2 combination, with Obright using his throwing axe primarily, is stellar. It really is. It works very, very well. Because, of course, they share the same... 
vulnerability and strength weapon bonuses. So if you go up against someone with a halberd, both of those warriors are going to be able to do additional damage. So you're looking at killing most normal troop types in two hits with an increased chance of critical strike due to the vulnerability to the axe and the mace. Makes sense in my head anyway. We do have to be very careful here. They are spread out, but that doesn't make them any less dangerous. Wing Knights, not so much of a problem anymore. They were a little bit of a bind last battle, but of course, the power scales down as we level up. I'll get Dantes in there to finish off the Wing Knight, I think. I don't want to range too far forward for a reason you will find out shortly. And a partnership back with Sybil there, always handy. Since they tend to fight together, it's rather usual for Sybil and Dantes to gain friendship quite quickly. Mm, don't want to move forward too much yet. I want to make sure that everyone is ready to engage before we do anything like this. And you're wondering, well, Total Base Kid, what are you doing? There's no one there. Well, it's Shining Force. Come on, there's always going to be someone there. Might as well let the Basil Soldier come to us so we can finish him off. Still doing pretty hefty damage. It's not pleasant to see that happening. But it's okay. So we can bring in the horse Oberite combination to deal with the Bezel Soldier. And even if we don't get a Power Crash, he does pretty good damage anyway. His damage is going to go through the roof next battle. I, you will find out why. There's an item, actually, that we can get for him. It is a ridiculously powerful weapon for this stage of the game. Stella. Very good indeed. It's nice to see Obright really doing some damage because he wasn't doing so well in earlier battles, and that's not normal, actually. Obright is usually a very, very good attacker. Right, now let's move forward a bit, and I shall demonstrate why I did not want to split up. Hey, it's Shining Force. It's an ambush. Well, not so much of an ambush. It's more like the clown car of Storic over there. Out comes an entire battalion of soldiers that we're going to have to deal with. Thankfully, since we're all relatively close together, we can move en masse. We're going to have to worry a little bit about the Hydra over there. And I'll skip forward just a bit, because the Hellhound has actually come from the rear. And is going to regret doing that. We don't get to see Irene fight as much as I would like, but she's got a new weapon. The, I believe it's the Iron Glove, and it's got increased critical strike and does a heck of a lot more damage. Now, we're going to deal with the Hydra and the Hellhound. These are both potentially lethal. If the Hydra and the Hellhound go after the same target, and your defense isn't as high as it should be, then you're looking at a possible kill, especially if the Hydra gets to attack first and uses its Poison Breath attack, something we definitely want to avoid. It's more than likely that the Hydra will go after Kite, but that would be the preferred damage soak, and we're going to try and stay in the woods for the extra defense bonus. Mm, no, I think we do actually need to do a little bit of damage there. Set up the defense bonus that we can get there. Now, by putting Dantes next to Kite, we've, of course, reduced the chance that the enemy will use its Poison Breath attack. As well as giving a nice defense bonus to Dantes, so that if, for instance, the Hydra decides to go after Dantes, who is on about half health, he should survive the hit. Always thinking. Eldar definitely looking to scale up in power a little bit in this fight, I would certainly hope. Now, I don't want... Khan does have a lot of HP, but does have relatively low defense, so I'd like to keep Khan out of the way, if at all possible. Sadly, Khan's mana pool is not so great. It seems that over the last few battles, Khan has been running out of mana very, very quickly. And that that is usual. Khan's mana doesn't scale up as well as Irene's or Grace's. Although his attack power tends to be a little bit better. Uh, I think we... No, uh, don't want to attack there. I was going to check, actually, if the Hellhound was classed as an evil enemy. And evil is actually a class of enemy. And the Ankh weapons do extra damage against evil enemies. But no. Evidently not. So we're just going to have to get rid of them the old-fashioned way. And as you probably noticed there, I've kept a hold of the Power Ankh as a secondary weapon. With the item that I gave to her actually gives a support spell, but gets rid of the Tornado spell. And the Tornado spell is pretty handy in situations like this. Get rid of one of these medical herbs and get something a little bit more useful. 
be able to deal with that Hellhound without too much of a problem. Typical Hayward brand overkill there. If we were playing the Shiny Force drinking game, we could take a drink now. Now these guys are going to move at maximum speed, at least the initial Vanguard will move at maximum speed towards our force. Thankfully not all of them do that, and as you can see there we're gaining a great defensive bonus from Obright being next to Dante's. So Dante's is going to take a heck of a lot more punishment. The rest of these fellows should stick around, so we can probably pick them off piecemeal, until of course the final charge where we will have to deal with several of them at once. Now here's the Hydra, and this is what I was dreading, Acid Breath, very unpleasant, does a lot of damage and reduces defense by a large amount, and getting rid of it is tricky. It doesn't go away on its own, at least if it does, it's got a really, really, really long duration. Ugh, come on Obright, get your act together. So we're going to have to watch out for. Kite's not going to be as an effective a tank now. However, Noon can finally get himself into the fray and utilize this freeze too. This is something that he learned last fight and is incredibly effective. It is massively effective. It uses quite a bit of mana, but the amount of damage it does is horrendous. 30 damage to the Hydra. They're very good and 49 XP gained. Now, that Aspia Mage, of course, has made a fatal mistake by moving so fast. We're going to attempt to pick off the Aspia Mage before he gets the opportunity to do any damage. Now, I'm just going to get rid of the Soldier. I don't want Masquerin too close to the Force. Masquerin can get one shot here very easily. Might as well use Blaze 2 to ensure a kill, or not that that was really necessary. That's one Bearsaw Soldier down and out of there. Now, if we charge Sybil forward and use Sybil and Dante's, hopefully, if at least one of them gets a special attack, then the Aspia Mage should go down. I wouldn't think Dante's normal attack would be enough to take it down from 16 to 0, but a charge certainly would. In the meantime, we need to get our healers back up there, because we're about to meet the main force, and the last thing I want to do is to do that with only Khan available with limited mana. No, we're not going to use the spear. We're going to make sure that we do this properly. So let's get out the lance. Move forward a little bit. It's a little bit risky because we're quite close to them, but... <laughs> Perfect. Gambit paid off, and that's one dead Aspia Mage. And level 13 for Dante's. With a good stats gain, so nothing to complain about there. Now, we should be able to finish off this Hydra before it gets to attack again. Move around to that side. And engage the Hydra with Eldar. Unfortunately, he's not going to be able to do too much damage. But the XP gain should be pretty good. Not horrendous, at any rate. Now, deciding what to do with Khan here is... Mm, I'm not entirely sure, to be honest. I was thinking maybe I could engage and just punch the living crap out of that Hydra. But no, I don't think it's worth the risk. Especially not with Kite sitting on 7 HP. If I've miscalculated the amount of turns that I get before the Hydra attacks again, then I'm very, very dead. So, let's not take that risk. Now, the rest of them have decided not to move, as you might expect, and are going to wait for us to assault them. Which is unfortunate. We generally run into this kind of situation, as you've probably noticed. That the last remnants, including the boss, will hang around and wait for us to get there. As opposed to coming along and getting ganked. Right. We've got to deal with this High Priest. Incredibly dangerous. Particularly because of the Aura effect. The Aura spell is an AoE heal, which is incredibly effective. And he can use it an awful lot. So I want to try and take him down. Now, the 1-2 combination isn't going to work here but I'm sure the 1-2-3 might. It's a bit of a risk. We're moving quite close to the enemy, but it's more of a risk leaving that character alive. I want that enemy thoroughly in the ground. And there we go. 
So the High Priest's not going to have the opportunity to heal anyone today or cast into rather dangerous Tornado 3. Unfortunately, that leaves a group of three out in the open. Now, Kite is gaining a defensive bonus from Obright, but has lost defense as a result of the Acid Breath. So as you can see, the defensive debuff is a little bit better than the defensive buff that we're getting for Obright. And he is about to get stuck with everything they've got. So hopefully the defensive bonus is going to be enough to allow him to hold out until we can get a healer in there. But they really are throwing everything they have at him. Thankfully the Winged Knights are not too effective, but still, five damage has got to whittle him down eventually. And they've still got a couple more characters they can move in. Thankfully I think the boss is probably either out of range or perhaps unwilling to move in. In the meantime we're going to have to move into some support here, because otherwise this is going to get very messy indeed. I'm going to use Sybil to heal Kite just to get him back up to full HP and hope that they don't decide then to go after Sybil and instead keep on beating on Kite who gets the defensive bonus. And moving Dantes in here is a risky venture. In fact, he can't actually reach anyone right now, although we could throw a spear, so we might as well do that. Not great damage, but any damage is better than no damage. And we're still trying to train up Dante's spear skill. I'm not entirely sure why he hasn't gained at least one rank in it. But there you go. Sometimes skill gains just take a long time. This is the Force Commander. Thankfully, he wields an axe. And the sword has no particular vulnerability to that. But he could still do quite a bit of damage. Shouldn't be too much of a problem. I think we can probably keep Kite up through all of that attack and hopefully manage to get rid of the, I would say adds, but that's quite frankly way too much WoW terminology for anybody. And I think we're geeky enough as we are right now. Okay, now I can use Horst here to attack the Force Commander, but I'm not going to do that. I would rather use him where he's more effective in attacking the Bezel Soldier. Well, the risk here is that if you throw everything you've got at the commander and you don't kill him within a turn, then if the rest of the enemy can swarm and deal horrendous amounts of damage to you. There really is no point in Kite actually attacking here. I'd rather he just stay alive and take the punishment. That is his role in most of the fights, as you probably noticed by now. Sadly, no weapon vulnerabilities there, but still a pretty hefty bit of damage and a friendship gain there with Hayward, which is going to be even more useful later on. Now, I've set it up so we can knock him down. It's a freeze rank two, and this should really clear things out. You know what? I'm becoming a little bit more tolerant of noon as a result of this. He sounds like a complete fool, but good lord does he put the damage out. We don't need that. The Angel's Wing is an item that is pretty much utterly useless. Oh no, this is where things go really wrong. This is probably going to be a kill. Yeah, and there it goes. Sometimes this can just happen. The Dire Wolf, you would have thought, would have gone after Kite. No. Actually decided to run all the way around the side and kill Masquerin for no apparent reason whatsoever. You can't do an awful lot to avoid it. Oh well, one loss is not too bad. Could have been an awful lot worse. It's not an easy fight. Now we need to clear out that Force Commander at this point. We can kill him within a turn, so I think we'll just go after the soldier instead and see if we can gain a little bit extra XP before we finish this particular fight. I would say that right now we're in a pretty safe position, and I don't think anything else as bad is going to happen. I certainly hope so. Wonderful special move. Seriously. Right, let's get Dantes in there. Perhaps we could finish off the night, or we could go in after the Dire Wolf. And down he goes. Might as well gain a little bit of spear skill there. Why not? 
pretty much down to a clear out now, to be quite honest. I don't see it being too much of an issue. Now, wings actually do count as swords, so we do get the vulnerability bonus, but it doesn't help, because Eldar's damage is still terrible. Now we have enough mana for one more heal. So I could do that, just to get a little bit extra experience. Why not? Khan's not going to get into battle range, so we might as well just gain an extra 10. You'll see a lot of players actually doing that a lot. They'll heal the most minor wounds with the healers, just to see and get some extra XP. Oh, there's the full swing. It's just like a critical strike. There's no additional effect. It's very dangerous, don't get me wrong. It does a horrendous amount of damage, and had we not perhaps cleared out a couple of the enemies beforehand, it would get very unpleasant. But since Grace is up next, I don't see that being too much of a problem. Now, what you'll notice here is if you do heal a large amount of health, you will get extra experience. It's not just a flat 10. Now, if you really want to grind up experience, what you do is you get the Aura spell, which does horrendous amounts of XP gain. But it also takes your mana pool down like no one's business. Force Commander down at 7 HP, so we should be able to finish him off with good measure. Although not before the Bearsall Soldier gets in on Noon. Thankfully, Noon, having been a promoted character, has significantly higher defense and a lot more HP, so can take the hit. But Horst will not be tolerating that today. Oh, no. Little ball of horned anger. What can I say? And down he goes. Let's finish this off and let's Kite have a little bit of vengeance. Huh? What an utterly inappropriate waste. Oh well, a good finish to a good fight. My name's been Total Biscuit. You've been watching Battle 16 of Let's Play Shining Force 3. I will see you next time, folks.